Escape will have been butchered on this movement. There are several teeth that have either been hammered on or squeezed with pliers. Some have been thinned to less than half their original thickness. They are different lengths and some have tips broken off. A new one would never match the look or gold gilt finish of the rest of the movement. I'll be rebuilding this original one. This way we'll be able to retain the original gold gilt and texture. This is the setup I use to add material to the damaged teeth. The brass wire acts as a heat sink. It allows the silver rod to flow onto the escape teeth as needed. 56% silver rod for filler is used. It's much stronger than the parent clock brass. So will outlast and outperform the original brass. Time to hand work the teeth. The index plate on the lathe headstock pulley is used to index each tooth every 12 degrees. The table on the lathe is set to the same angle of the original teeth. Marking the teeth helps to see where the file is cutting. Rotate 12 degrees, lock the spindle in place. For the back side of each tooth, I move the table on the lathe to the back side. Angle of cut is controlled by the location of the table. Depth of cut is controlled by different thicknesses of paper shims. Paper shims also protect the table from being cut from the file. Now to give it a test and see if it performs as it was designed to. some radical to hold the balance jewel in place temporarily. Gears all look free. Hold some slight pressure on the third wheel and it's in motion. It's working great, much better than when I received it. Every tooth is making a solid lock on the pallet surfaces now. Time to hand work the thickness of the teeth. Quality files from reliable makers perform the best. Different profiles help to get into difficult tight areas. The teeth and rim have been textured to match the gold gilt texture on the rest of the wheel. Polish with a soft brass brush to blend it to the gold gilt finish. It blended in nice. Will look much better once it's put through the final cleaning process. I see someone added two plastic shim washers. They shimmed the plates for some reason. It looks like a celluloid plastic. Celluloid hasn't been made since the 1940s. Now to assemble the movement to see if removing the shims has negatively affected the end shake. All good except the escape wheel. No end shake at all. It's going to need to be adjusted. Center wheel. Third wheel. Fourth wheel.
escape wheel needs 10 to 15 thousandths more tolerance to correct inshake. I can either remove material off the arbor or adjust the bushing. Less intrusive and reversible to adjust a bushing, so we'll go that route. This bushing goes to the escape wheel. It's too long, so I'll replace it first. Press the old one out. Here's the new bushing, time to press it in. Ream to fit the pivot. Escape wheel inshake is great now, but the lower pivot is bent, so it's best to repivot it. New pivot turned out great. This will help it keep better time. Escape wheel rotates nice and smooth now. Fourth wheel pivots have a lot of slop. Oh, the part of the pivot that the second hand amounts to is quite bent. The area that goes through the bushing is okay. It's the area past that point that is bent. This heavy scoring is on the bearing surface. Will need to be resurfaced before a new bushing is fit. First to straighten the pivot. Use this dead center to guide the straightening process. Looking good now. The pivot polished up nicely. Mainspring arbor is loose in the barrel. It's allowing the barrel to tilt while in service. This bearing surface fits up to the front plate. It has two tool marks on it, 180 degrees from each other. Looks like someone grabbed a hold of it with a pair of wire cutters. Raised burrs have been left on each nick. And here, brass residue on the surface from the burrs eating away at the plate. The bearing surface is the same size as the square for the key, so it's only going to be able to be polished down to a minimal amount. This rounded area on the key square, it's from using a key that's too large. This pivot has two marks on it as well. They're on the non-working surface, so no issues to deal with. Barrel cap has been butchered. Punch and hammer marks on the surface. This is done to close the hole up instead of installing a bushing. score marks where someone has filed or sanded the cap. The gold gilt has been damaged, probably after it was distorted after hammering on it. These circular marks are from when it was fabricated new. There's gold gilt on top of these. The other straight ones are through to the brass.
it's really worn out of tolerance. The bearing surfaces will need to be polished before bushings are installed. I'll do a light polish and see how it looks. Deep scores. We'll need to use a couple of stones first. Much better. Now to make the front pivot look like this back pivot. The barrel cap is cut to a perfect diameter. The hull is up to 13 thousandths off center. All these punch and hammer marks have pushed the hole over so it's no longer centered. Doing a visual check in a six-jawed chuck shows just how far off it is. Machine the center true again. Cut a couple of bushings from a piece of cast brass rod. They're going to fit just fine. Deburr the edges before the bushings are installed. I'll let the bushing protrude beyond each surface so it can be hammered for a nice curl over fit. Hammering will also work harden the brass.
out of board out true and slightly undersized. Excellent fit. It will need to be hand worked for a looser fit. Barrel cap is deformed. Probably intentional to adjust for in shake. Bushing will need to be hand worked flush with the surface. This tape will prevent damage in the gold gilt. Bluing makes it easier to see where the cut is happening. Deburr the bushings. Mainspring arbor is loose enough to rattle. This will ensure enough freedom to transfer uninterrupted torque from the mainspring to the train. It's good to go. A tight arbor will cause a torque and power loss. Perfect. Click rivet is loose in the plate. Rivet is recessed, so need a small stump to contact the face of the rivet. The head of this nail is the right thickness. Time to make a stump out of this nail. It's backing the rivet up just great. The dial is distressed and has lost over 50% of its silvering. In removing the dial, the number 234 is found hand stamped on the brass casting of the bezel. Before resilvering, this modified seconds hand hole will need to be smoothed out some. Under magnification, it shows the rough tooling used in an attempt to remove the burr. The underlying brass surface is rough and full of large pits. The splotches of black areas is oxidized copper, where the brass has been desinctified. Pits and oxidized areas will need to be cleaned and degreased completely for the silver to have a continuous plating. The pits are too deep to remove. Cleaned and resilvered. Time to reapply the black. I use a shellac based ink. It's water resistant and flows on nicely. The brush I use is small, so cooling the dial down keeps the ink flowing nicely and prevents it from drying too fast. With the condition of the dial so rough, it's important to stay in the lines to prevent staining. A top coat of clear finish has been applied to protect the silvering on the dial. Looks great. Even better mounted in the bezel. Under magnification, you can see the original pitting and rough surface has been preserved. Even the original witness lines put in for the cutting of the dial are still there. 
It was best not to resurface this dial to keep all these fine age details intact. Mounting posts keep the pivot holes of the two plates aligned when the mainspring is wound. This one is loose and needs to be tightened. This punch is shaped to fit these particular splines on the post. I'll lightly punch each spline to swage the metal to a snug fit. This anvil will put all the force against the shoulder of the mounting post. It'll protect the threads from becoming deformed. Looks good. No one will be able to know it was worked on. Now to adjust this balance staff jewel setting. The OD is too small. It falls straight through the hole. Needs to be adjusted to a snug friction fit. I'll put a knurl on it by rolling it between a piece of oak hardwood and a file. Little too light, not enough pressure. That should do it. Presses in nice and snug now. Next item is to deal with this crudely made hairspring taper pin. This one is made from steel. They should always be made out of non-magnetic materials like brass. The flat surfaces on it will twist the hairspring to a different direction every time it's inserted. Another sign a butcher has been here. I'll put it in to get a general size needed for a replacement. Now to find a good fitting one. Excellent. Hairspring needs to be adjusted to a free fit between the regulator pins. I'll use this hairspring tool. Adjustment needs to be so spring follows the same arc as the regulator pins. And at the same time, the collet needs to be centered on the balance staff jewel. A hairspring can't be set up with the spring mounted on the staff. Well, I'll power the movement up and hope for the best. Nice. The movement self-started. This is a sign it's been set up correctly. Balance wheel has excellent motion. The hand-worked escape wheel teeth must be spot on. The regulator pin broke from hairspring wear. The brass is worn to 50% of the original thickness in areas. Just too weak for service. If you look real close, you can see four or five wear spots from the hairspring working on it over the years. 
This was the most worn spot where it broke. This sharp cut end is where someone cut it shorter for some reason. Many hours of runtime to wear these this deep. The old pin will need to be removed. It's been swaged here on the top using a hollow flat surface to punch. I think I'll attempt to drill out the old pin. Using a drill bit slightly smaller than the pin. Center punching the pin will keep the drill bit centered. Now to drill the pin free from the regulator arm. I'll use some brass wire the same size as the original pin. Old pin is 20 thousandths in diameter. Great, I have some wire in stock that will fit perfect. Rough cut a piece slightly longer than what is needed. Since it's wire and not straight rod material, it's going to need to be straightened. First I'll rough straighten it with a couple of wood blocks. <laughs> then finish straighten on a machined steel surface. Nice and straight. Remove the oxidation and it looks new. Flatten the end to get rid of that cut mark. A temporary full scale sketch of the pin to use as a bending guide and to get the correct length and bend. I use a sacrificial copper wire, the same diameter for a sample. Once fitted and all looks good, the copper wire is straightened and used to size the brass one to length. Hollow punch fits the pin just right. Swage the pin in place. A nice tight fit. Soft jawed tweezers prevents leaving nicks and tool marks on the brass. Looks good. Balance spring has good motion between the regulator pins.
Now to do a final cleaning and see how it turns out. Balance has excellent motion. If you look close, you can see the trundles wiggling with each impulse of the escape wheel. For the age of the movement, the trundles show zero wear. Maybe revolving trundles is not that bad of an idea. Time to install the movement in the case. There's one fastener hole marked in blue tape for a long screw. It's because there's one long mismatched long screw. I found a shorter replacement that fits better. Fresh, resilvered finish on the dial sure looks good. A nice Japanese Imperial Navy ship's clock.